Good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this morning we shall be continuing with our discussion on Germany. Uh, depending on our time, I'm hoping to complete my discussion here. Um, we have seen before, uh, I'm sorry, after the midterm exam, we have been talking about, uh, for the moment or until this moment, we've been talking about the US case and the German case. So the plan ahead is that after we complete the German case, we'll switch to the case on J Japan, Japanese politics and comparative perspective. So, um, and then we'll write the um, final exam. Um, this Friday, let me announce to you that we shall be writing an in-class assignment on uh, immigration, citizenship, multiculturalism, and policies addressing all these in the case of Germany. You shall be given excerpts to watch uh, from different documentaries, uh, di from different sources, most of which stem from or come from uh, Deutsche Welle. Um, so, so, so most of the stuff will be on multiculturalists or policies addressing multiculturalism, immigration, uh, the, the guest worker phenomena, guest worker, uh, the Gastarbeiter phenomena in Germany. Um, so, so we shall be writing the in-class assignments Friday, uh, starting at 9.40, which will take less than about um, the full, full hour. Uh, so it'll be around 40 minutes or so. Okay, so um, the same rules apply. Uh, those of you who've taken um, two in-class assignments already will not be able to take the third um, in-class assignment. Those of you who've taken one, please, please, please take this, this in-class assignment. It's vital. It is worth five points. Uh, it'll count towards uh, five points towards your final grade. Okay, um, we've been covering uh, state and historical perspective, political economy of economic and social policies, governance and policy making. I think I've completed my discussion there. Um, you know, with we've looked at the executive um, policy making practices, policy, um, and also you know, um, uh, new or neo corporatism. Okay, so so now I shall be talking about representation and participation this class, uh, and then we'll. We'll continue with um, current challenges, and then uh, we'll finish off there. OK, let's see where we are. OK, we've looked at all this here. Oops, please, OK. We need to get rid of you, and then click. OK. Um, representation and participation. Let's look at what the legislature looks like. Uh, we have a bicameral legislature in the case of Germany. Uh, we've got the, the lower house, the Bundestag, and the upper house, the Bundesrat. Okay. Um, elections for Bundestag is a simultaneous two-ballot system. It's a two-ballot system, as I shall explain in a few moments, but it's a simultaneous two-ballot system. It's not that it, is, it has two separate ballots in two different times, like the French case. We, we do not have that. We have one single ballot divided into two, the right-hand side and the left-hand side. Okay? Um, the, in the Gesundheit, in the left-hand side, this is, by the way, this is uh, what I'm showing you is what I got from your textbook, uh, Kesselman, Krieger, and Joseph. Um, the, each, each voter at the poll station will be casting one single um, paper, but, but two votes, okay? So, so two stamps. On the left, we have candidates, okay? And on the right, we have parties. So this is basically a party list. This is a list of candidates for a particular district. We have around 299 or 300 districts or constituencies 
in Germany. So, so the 16 lander, land, lander is made up of about 300 constituencies. And for each constituency, voters will be casting a vote here. And on the land basis, region basis, they'll also be casting another vote. Okay, so two ball in that in this respect, it is in this respect that we have a two ballot system. Okay, this is sometimes called the butterfly ballot. Okay, because it is divided into two. Um, the first part, the second part, the first vote, uh, and the second vote. Okay, once again, on the on the left, well, on the left hand side. Um, you or the voters choose candidates. On the right-hand side, they choose political parties. So it's a party list, once again. So on the left-hand side, the rule, the electoral rule, is that it's a um, single-member district plurality. So whomever gets the highest number of votes among the candidates, this is for Bonn, by the way, the city of Bonn, um, will be elected from that district, okay? So, so it's basically a winner-takes-all system. There are, as you can see, one, two, three, four, five, six candidates. The fifth one is gone. Six candidates in total. Whomever gets the, the highest number of votes from this six will be elected to the Bundestag. And on the right-hand side, it's a proportional system. So think of the Bundestag as uh, with 630 seats. About 300 seats, about half, is coming from this side. Another half, in fact more than half, will be elected through this system. Okay, the party list. So, so here, uh, candidates elect, um, I'm sorry, voters elect candidates. Here, voters elect the party they wish to see in the parliament. Okay, and, um, and here, there's a party list. And um, the system here, the electoral system here, is proportional representation. Here, it's winner takes all. Here is proportional. We know the difference between um, winner-takes-all systems and proportional systems, right? In order to, to ensure some kind of stability in the system, here we have a 5% national threshold. So if a political party um, wins less than 5% of the national votes, they will not have any representation in the parliament. Is this clear? Okay, very good. So um, each candidate is elected for four years. So every four years, almost written on stone, uh, we have national elections. And two major parties win most of the seats, historically, since 1940s, late 1940s, through this plurality system. Okay. Because remember we talked about the case, the fact that plurality systems um, help outcomes converge to two large parties. It amasses power to the large parties because of many mechanisms, uh, because of many reasons. Um, and the 5% also limits, the, the national threshold also limits the number of political parties represented in the parliament. So no, no very small parties are represented in the parliament because of the 5% national threshold. Clear? Very good. OK. Um, so, so this entire system magnifies the powers of those two large, large coalitions, large parties, um, the SPD, the Social Democratic Party on the one hand, and the Christian Democratic Party and Christian Social Union, the CDU, CSU. Okay, CSU is the Bavarian counterpart 
of CDU, um, more or less within the same coalition. So uh, CDU is not organized, um, or, or CDU or voters, you know, um, you know uh, politicians are organized under CSU in Bavaria, uh, whereas in the rest of the country we have the CDU. Um, here in the, so, so this is basically the butterfly ballot for the Bundestag, okay? And we also have a second chamber in the system. It's a bicameral system. It's called the Bundesrat. Okay? And um, Bundesrat, members of the Bundesrat are in a way, what, maybe it's sometimes referred to as an election. It's basically a delegation from the land, land governments, from the regional governments. Each regional government sends a delegation to the Bundesrat. Okay, so we have only 65, 66 seats in the Bundesrat. Each state, we have 16 Länder. Each Land has at least three delegates. Okay, send they at least they send at least three delegates, depending on the population of um, the um, the Land. Um, it, so so this, this, the size of the delegation will depend on the population of the land. So, so each land government elect and send delegates to the Bundesrat. So we have two houses, the upper house, the Bundesrat, 66 members, the lower house, the Bundestag, 630 members. In fact, now we have a 631 member Bundestag. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll show um, results um, of, the, of the most recent election um, a bit later on. So, um, so here they vote, voters vote based on the district. So Germany is divided into about 300 districts, 299 districts. Here it's, uh, it's, it's based on the land level. Okay, so, so this is how elections take place. Um, let me talk to you about a little bit about um, the Bundestag and the Bundesrat. In the Bundestag, there is voting along party discipline. So members of parliament vote along the party line. Okay? So, so they, they more or less have a consistent position. That's what we call party discipline. Um, we have around 630 members. In fact, for the, for, the, for the current Bundestag, we have 631 members. Um, the executive, I mean, the, here is the legisl legislative process. The executive introduces legislation. Bills are sent to the Bundestag committee, so lower house first, the parliament. Um, it's read three times. So the public is made aware of what's happening. If it passes the Bundestag, for it to become law, a bill must also be passed or approved by the Bundesrat. Okay, and in, in both houses, we have a simple majority as a rule. Okay, so, um, so there is a little bit of deliberation in the committees, and there's also um, information raising, um, raising information, uh, raising awareness um, to inform the public um, when the three readings are carried out. Uh, the Bundesrat, in a way, provides expertise to uh, the Bundestag committees. The idea of having a Bundesrat is to ensure that there is a power balance between the federal and the land level. So members of the Bundesrat change, rotate, when there are elections taking place at the land level. There are land level elections and there are federal level elections. Okay? So for the Bundesrat, the, the upper house, Whomever 
is sent by the current government at the land level will be represented in the Bundesrat. So, so representatives in the Bundesrat come from regional governments, from the land governments, whomever has, you know, depending on the majority or depending on um, the, the power balance in the land or at the land level or land government level, they'll be sent to, according to that share, they'll be sent to as delegation to, or members of the delegation to the Bundesrat. Uh, so so, so it, the idea is to strike a balance between the land level and the federal level. Um, once again, each land sends at least three representatives. Uh, we have in the current uh, Bundesrat 69 members. I said 66, but uh, we have 69 members, close to 70. Um, and once again, the political composi composition of the Bundesrat will rotate with every election taking place at the 16 Länder level. That means we do not have, in general, we do not have simultaneous elections taking place at the federal as well as the land level. The land level elections take place in different times of the year, in different years. Um, sometimes they coincide, but they, don't, they do not have to. And once those elections take place at each land, the composition of the Bundesta Bundesrat, I'm sorry, changes. Is this clear? It's a little bit complicated, but once you get a hold of it, you'll get it. Um, suspensive veto, uh, the institution of suspensive veto, the rule of suspensive veto, the Bundestag can override the Bundesrat vote if Bundesrat votes down, um, if, if the Bundesrat vetoes a bill by two thirds, then the Bundestag has to approve the bill by more than two thirds to overcome it, to suspend the veto of the upper house. So, so in case of a veto by the Bundesrat, the Bundestag can overcome it by more than two thirds majority, so super majority or qualified majority, uh, in order to override the vote. So this is, these are the houses of the Bundestag and the Bundesrat. Um, let me now talk to you about the party system. We had traditionally a two and a half party system in Germany until about the 1980s. We had two largest parties, the Christian Democratic Union, CDU and the SPD, the so uh, Social Democratic Party. And also we had a third party, the Free Democrat Party or Free Democratic Party. So um, the SPD is center left. It was more left, but from the 60s onwards, more social democratic left, uh, center left, the C SPD, the Social Democratic Party. The center right party, Christian Democrats, uh, center right, and um, Free Democratic Party, small centrist party, liberal in many senses, as I shall be explaining a little bit later on. Um, but until about this time, until about the 80s, we had these three parties. And we had this third party as sometimes referred to as a swing party. Others refer to this party as a kingmaker. So, so what happens is, let's say one party gets 34% of the votes, let's say CDU, and SPD gets 33% of the votes. So how will they ever form a coalition? And Freie Democrats, 
will get, let's say, 12% of the votes. So what happens then? There has to be a coalition. So whomever gets the approval of the Freie Democrats will form the coalition. Okay, sometimes we have seen uh, cases where both largest parties um, receiving around the same, you know, in terms of the percentages, around the same number of seats. And the kingmaker is the FDP. FDP. Okay, so whomever the FDP aligns with will rule the day, will form the coalition, and will, will rule the country. So it is in that respect, it is both a swing party, so it has formed coalitions with the center-right and also the center-left in the post-World War II era, uh, those decades. And it is in the sense that it is called a kingmaker. So, so uh, whomever the party aligns with will um, or have been um, you know, forming uh, the coalition and had been presiding over the coalition. But this has been changing you know, since 1980s. Um, there are other parties uh, on the left who've been emerging as, as powerhouses. Uh, the Greens, uh, the Party of Democratic Socialism, sometimes referred to as the Linke, the Lefts, um, and National Democratic Party, German People's Union, so small, right-wing, regional influence, which have regional influence in Landtag elections. So, so other small parties coming into the picture and emerging above the 5% threshold. Don't forget, yes, there are small parties, but for small parties to be represented in the Bundestag, they have to pass through this 5% national threshold. Okay? Um, so let's, let's see uh, what these political parties look like. Um, the Christian Democratic Party, Christian Democrats, CDU, and its counterpart uh, in Bavaria, CSU, um, the party had been formed um, in the post-World War II era, 1945. Um, it's the largest party in terms of membership. Um, it has been able to unite Christians on both sides, Christians, you know, Catholics, as well as Protestants. So, so, um, and it emerged as a center-right as well as a catch-all party. So a catch-all party um, which has been supported by um, you know, basis of political power-wise, um, supported by both the Catholics as well as um, the Protestants. It has been emphasizing, it has been um, stressing the importance of the soziale Marktwirtschaft. So the social market economy it has been an ideal shared by both sides across the fence. So on, on both sides of the political party spectrum, we have both the SPD as well as the CDU and the CSU coalition supporting the social market economy okay, during the decades 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s and 90s. Um, so, so social market economy has been, uh, has been branded by, by both parties. Um, and um, the Christian Democratic Union have, have, I mean, the party has, has also been emphasizing the key role that this political economic social system has been playing in post-World War II miracle, the, the so-called German miracle. Um, they have been in coalitions with FDP, uh, the Freie Democrat Partei, um, with or because of FDP's emphasis on economic liberalism. Okay, we, we will, I'll talk about that later on. Um, let's talk about the SPD, the uh, Social Democratic Party, founded in the last quarter of the 19th century, around 1875. So it's basically the, the oldest party. It's the second largest party 
um, consistently um, in the parliament, uh, having um, o always the second largest number of votes in terms of vote shares, in terms of she uh, seats in the parliament. Um, up until the late 1950s, um, it had more Marxist leanings, um, but from late 1950s, you know, 1959, it has um, reorganized, reformed its political program. So it's become more social democratic and de-emphasized Marxist elements. And it has been a um, members, member of coalitions, especially throughout the 1970s, in which we have the strengthening of the German welfare state. Okay, so, so the German welfare state had been uh, thoroughly consolidated, large, comprehensive, uh, generous welfare state, uh, also because of SPD's um, influence in those coalition years. Um, so, so, um, so it has been a supportive of the social market economy, especially its social policy aspects. We've talked about social policy aspects as well as, you know, the welfare state aspects as well as um, the economic policy aspects, okay? So SPD is, is leaning more towards its social or emphasizing um, its social policy, welfare state, stronger welfare state, comprehensive, generous welfare state aspects of the Soziale Marktwirtschaft. Um, in comparison to the Christian Democrats who have been emphasizing um, the, the German economic policy making um, apparatuses, the Modell Deutschland um, in that respect, which, uh, which we can talk about later. Um, and they've been forming coalitions um, with Greens, most recently, late 1990s, um, Gerhard Schröder, forming coalitions uh, with the Greens, um, so SPD-led coalitions, um, and had formed what's called grand coalitions with the CDU. Um, so, so all kinds of coalitions with, um, with Greens, Joschka Fischer, and, and you know, other leaders, um, and also grand coalitions with the CDU and Basically, what I'm referring to here is a, a coalition between CDU and SPD, um, where two largest parties come together. Um, Greens are also important. Increasingly, when we talk about Greens, we talk about a, a largely um, heterogeneous group, um, many factions, citizen action groups within it. We have environmental activists, we have farmers, we have anti-nuclear movement uh, joining forces with the Greens. Uh, we have peace movements, we have Marxists, we have Leninists, all coming together under this, this umbrella of Greens. Please. A part, uh, uh, yes, yes, he is, he is uh, one of the um, co-chairs, co-presidents of, uh, of uh, the, Grüne, the Green Party, um, you know, Turkish-German or German-Turkish or German of Turkish descent. Uh, Cem Özdemir is, is, is one of the leaders of the Greens, the Green Party. Um, has been increasing its support over time, especially 1980s, but, but more so 1990s, 2000s, um, with their program emphasizing anti-nuclear power, um, anti-GMO, um, careful about, so let's be very careful, let's be cautious about climate change, let's emphasize climate change. As you can see, it has many antis um, um, related to it. So, so it is sometimes referred to as an anti-party uh, in that respect. So anti-party party. Um, there are, obviously there are factions within it given its heterogeneity. Um, there are realists within it. So leaning more towards center, center left. 
and there are more fundamentalists uh, who are leaning towards the left of the social democratic left. Uh, the FDP, the swing party, the kingmaker, has, when you look at its history, uh, has been in alliances, has been forming coalitions with both the FDP, I'm sorry, with both the CDU, I'm sorry, CSU, as well as the SPD. In that respect, it has been serving as the kingmaker in the system. Um, it has a liberal program, especially in, um, in economic matters, uh, less fair, deregulation, uh, independent um, regulatory institutions, uh, privatization. So all of these have been uh, part and parcel of FDP programs, electoral pledges. Um, Social-wise, it is less, much, much less conservative than CDU, CSU coalition. So uh, civil rights and liberties, um, um, but but much less from a much less conservative stance uh, compared to the CDU, CSU line. Uh, the link the left forces, the left um, have they've been they've been gaining strength in um, in recent decades, two um, thousands. GDR Communist Party merged with a faction, a more um, left-wing faction arising from SPD. So um, they've formed, they, they call themselves the lefts, okay, those on the left. Um, opposition, or stronger opposition, uh, they've been mounting a stronger opposition to budget cuts, uh, especially if these budget cuts are focusing on or, or, or addressing the unemployed, uh, addressing the marginalized, so, so they've been voicing concerns over, um, you know, we shouldn't have, um, we should keep the German model, we should keep the German welfare state, uh, we should protect the unemployed, we should protect the marginalized. And it is through this discourse that they have been, and also action, that they have been um, providing an alternative to the far right. Okay, so they've they've really provided the German voters an alternative to the far right, the nationalist far right, who've been opposing change, who've been opposing globalization, who've been opposing um, you know forces of uh, both the market and also you know um, international organizations uh, who've been bearing down upon in their eyes the German model. So um, they've, been, they've been increasing their votes uh, throughout these, these years, uh, throughout these decades. Um, let's see what the uh, results look like. Um, this is 1949. This is when the, the FRG, Federal Republic of Germany, was, was founded. Um, this, these are the percentages of seats. Uh, these are others, the gray lines, the gray parts, shades. CDU is here. Um, this is SPD, CDU, SPD, FPD, and, um, and Greens and the lefts. As you can see, until about the 1980s, uh, we have three parties in the system. So three shades here. The CDU, CSU, SPD, and Freie Democrats. But from the 1980s onwards, other parties come into the picture. So it was a two and a half party system up until here. But then we have what you can see here is more like a multi-party system with two large parties with smaller parties following those, okay, in terms of vote shares. Um, voter turnout had also been, had always been quite stable. Um, it was around the range of 90, around, you know, 85, 90%. It is around 80%, 79 to 80 something. Uh, but still, you know, it's quite stable, quite, I mean, very high by, by advanced industrialized country standards. Uh, always above 
79, 80%, and going up to about 90%. So, so as you can see, as you can imagine, we have a, a lively electorate. Um, yes, there has been some declines in turnout um, due to some burnout, but this is much less pronounced in comparison to the US or the UK, and to a certain extent to, to France. So, so we have an active citizenry um, casting their ballots, casting their, their votes at the ballots, um, still even to this day. And um, once again, we had two major parties and FDP as the kingmaker until the 1980s. Then from then onwards, we have changes in the system. So what you can see here, we're groping towards more of a multi-party system. Okay. Um, let's see what the current uh, Bundestag looks like. Okay, so this is what the Bundestag looks like. So whenever we refer to the parliament, we categorically refer to the lower house. The lower house is the Bundestag, uh, around 636 seats. Um, CDU, CSU, uh, with 311 seats. Uh, Bündnis 90, uh, the Grüne, they have a coalition of uh, representing 63 seats. The SPD, almost 200 seats, 193 seats. Uh, the Linke, the left, um, 64 seats. So, so what you can see here is um, is more like a multi-party system, uh, which also is shown, uh, which which you also you can see in the um, in the uh, in the total um, votes counted. Uh, so that was the distribution of seats in the 18th Bundestag. Um, interests, social movements, and protests. I think I've stressed adequately how important, how central democratic corporatism is, or neo-corporatism, or new corporatism is. Um, I may have emphasized that this is a networked society, that there is consensus building, that there is cooperation, that there is collaboration. I've also learned last week that this is rather new um, because what produced the Weimar government or during the Weimar government, what produced National Socialism in the 1930s was the lack of collaboration, lack of cooperation, but fragmentation. Okay, so, so this was in a way effectively bricolaged. It was built bit by bit in the system from the 1940s, 50s onwards. So, so we have, uh, yes, we have a, a historical legacy of, of collaboration, cooperation, but we also have a historical legacy of fragmentation non-collaboration, no cooperation, and hence, isn't tight, and hence um, World War II. So the idea of never again has also has, has been very important at the back of um, the German citizenry. And, and this was, um, you know, um, this, this networked society, this collaboration, cooperation have, have all been very important elements of uh, the German model, um, what makes up the Soziale Marktwirtschaft, uh, that everybody is incorporated, everybody is included, social inclusion is, is very important, um, has been an intrinsic element of the system. Um, you know, clubs, social clubs, uh, sports clubs, um, they've, they've, they've been very active. Um, in, in Germany, so as in groups, uh, doing things in groups, 
So bowling alone, as opposed to bowling alone, increasingly bowling alone in the US, we, we have a more cohesive society in Germany, um, it is argued in the literature. Um, we have, you know, within this, within this context, we have interest groups and parapublic institutions, um, which in a way appease social conflict. So meetings, um, coordination, these are very important. Um, cooperative system, consensual system, um, and therefore we do not have mass protests, unlike France. So in France we have mass protests, people taking up to the streets. We do not have that kind of protest movements in Germany. Whereas we have them on the streets in France, they're organized in different parties, in different, different civil society institutions, and they, are, they articulate their voices through social movements. Okay, so, so it's a more networked society, it's a more organized society, uh, and, and interest representation, interest intermediation is much more organized, coordinated, as opposed to other societies. So this is an example of a coordinated, consensual, cooperative, networked, in that respect, neocorporatist system of interest intermediation, as opposed to the US and Britain, where we have a more pluralist form of interaction. In those pluralist forms, we have, you know, whomever gets or whomever, you know, possesses the, the highest power, the largest power, will have a say in the system. But here, there are institutionalized channels of access to groups within the society, and that the state turns a sympathetic ear to those groups, okay? And there are institutionalized channels of privileged access to trade unions on the one hand, business unions, business associations, on the other, okay. So, so this is um, this I, I wish to to emphasize. But protest and mobilization had been increasing. Um, you know, 1960s feminist movement, peace movement, anti-nuclear movement, some activity there. Um, but 1990s had been um, a spur of protests. Um, you know, right-wing protests. Uh, which were coupled with neo-Nazi racist attacks. 2000s have seen um, the Iraq war. Okay, so, so many people taking up to the streets. I'll keep you for another minute or two um, to wrap up the German case uh, with the current challenges. Um, smaller parties gaining strength as we have seen is this a sign of fragmentation or more pluralism imbued in, in the system? Uh, remember we had two largest parties plus the kingmaker back then up until 80s, so 50s, 60s, 70s, so more than 30 years, three decades. Uh, but this has been changing towards a more multi-party um, system. Is this going to bring with it fragmentation. That's, that's one general concern among um, poly, you know, um, you know, observers as well as experts, but also among the general public. And collective identities, who is German? The conception of Germanness, German identity. There's a lot of debate here. Um, when you visit Germany, especially large metropolitan centers, um, you see, you've been seeing Kreuzberg, Alishvegishmak is a Kreuzberg shopping center, many signs in, Turk uh, in, in Turkish. If you visit Kreuzberg, Berlin, uh, on the western part, you see um, a, 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 you know, a market Turkish influence. Uh, you know, Turkey and Germany had um, official agreements, 61, then 64, 
second wave, then later on. Um, so all throughout the 60s, Turks were invited to Germany. They were most welcome in their efforts helping build or rebuild and reconstruct Germany. Well, with the 1980s onwards, with rising unemployment and all this, the picture has been changing. And we've seen uh, many incidents in Germany, uh, skinhead movements. Um, they've, been, they've, been, um, they've been having atrocities. They've been making atrocities against Turks. Uh, Turks burnt to flame, um, lit to flame. And, um, and this, is also, this has also been, um, been continuing. Uh, much more sporadically than uh, back in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, but, but the idea of the Gastarbeiters, the guest workers who've come to Germany as migrants, economic migrants, well, in time they've brought their families through policies of reunification, I'm sorry, family unification. With that, more than 300, three, uh, 3 million in Germany out of 80 million. So, um, so the, the identity or self-conception of Germans, German identity has been changing. Um, and Germany now addresses itself more or less as a settler country, a country of immigration. You know, we have countries of immigration Western offshoots, right? Uh, North America, Australasia. But, but Germany now is coming to grips with um, redefining itself as a country of migration. Um, so, so changing conception of you know, who is German. So, so are these migrants still after 50 years? Do we call them? in their 60 years, the first generation, the second generation, the third generation, the fourth generation is about to, to emerge? Do we call them still guest workers? Or have they become more or less an ethnicity within Germany? OK, so, so the idea of German identity, so this is what we read um, in books, in novels, in film, um, in movies. Um, and this is also what we hear in, in expert opinion, in political discourses, um, in observers' um, op-eds and all that. So, so it is very much on the agenda. You know, how do we redefine our system? Do we redefine multiculturalism? How do we come to terms with, um, with the changing social reality? Um, Stress caused by refugees and asylum seekers in the most recent period, as you, mu you, you must have read in the news, you must, must have heard uh, last year, Angela Merkel had been cooperating with uh, the Turkish government, uh, you know, that there was a package deal of some billion euros. Um, so, 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 so how do we deal with the current challenge of, uh, of mass mobility, mass inflow? How do we regulate this otherwise irregular movement? Hmm? How do we regulate this? How do we change the behavior of, of, of all these actors? And is this going to cause a resurgence in German nationalism? Is there going to be a backlash? Or if so, how will it play out? More sociologically, more culturally, less politically. Instead of how do we respond this? So we're all concerned about you know how is uh, German society going to be reacting to to all these these changes? And finally, eurozone crisis, um, which has been felt uh, in the early period, uh, especially, but but later on, uh, we didn't have mass bank failures. We didn't have mass unemployment. Um, but the German economy, which has been the motor force, the locomotive of the European economy, has been slowing down, but still uh, has been picking up with rising levels of job creation uh, and lowering of unemployment rates. Uh, elsewhere 
across Europe, we had uh, skyrocketing rates of unemployment, especially among you guys, especially in, in your category. This hasn't been so pronounced in Germany. This has been so much pronounced elsewhere in Europe, especially in the most hardest hit countries like um, Greece, to a certain extent Italy, but also Portugal, Spain, the Southern Rim. Um, but this has been much pronounced, much less pronounced in the German case because of uh, how inclusive the society is, but also because of the less uh, um, the less severity of the crisis um, as experienced in Germany. <sighs> any questions? I talk too much, I feel. Um, any questions? Okay, this completes our discussion on Germany. Um, and we'll start off with the case on Japan next time. See ya.